Okay. This is a recording of the class on July 15th. It's the second day of Confucius. And Zane has started the conversation by talking about the news articles at the end of the, the second reading I had you read. And the Chinese are not trying to imitate America, right? They have, their priority is good governance, which means, I'll add this Zane, I think this, I think you would go with this, uh, rule for the benefit of the ruled. And so they're claiming that their system actually rules for the benefit of the ruled better than the United States. Is that fair, Zane? Okay. And again, I'm not saying this because I'm trying to convince you to be, you know, communists or socialists at all. I'm just telling you, just so you wake up and realize how it is that other people perceive us and then what alternatives other countries have. And right now, we don't have the moral authority we used to have. We aren't, it's not, there was a 50 years there or 40 years there when we did have quite a bit of more respect than we have now for better or worse. I mean, again, I just was like, I'm not, I'm not proselytizing. I'm not preaching. My, my goal is to just throw a new idea at you and completely mess up your mind every day. How's that? Go ahead. I like discussing how we don't have the moral high ground anymore. Uh, I was, I, okay, I was talking about class after class history with my dad. And I was talking about like how I think a lot of America's actions are imperialistic. And he was like, got really mad about it. And he was like, no, they're not. We didn't like need to go in. And I was like, well, I think that um, we can't really have a moral high ground if we have to go into different places and impose our rule without seeing like how it rules amongst themselves. And like, I'm, there are a lot of problems with communism, but there's also a lot of things that get solved with communism and we can't just ignore that. Yeah, I think we can't ignore it because we have to start understanding why Africans might prefer the Chinese to us, right? <laughs> what we have to do to try and convince developing countries not to go with China. I mean, for whatever, does that make sense, Jordan? I think there's something like, especially in nations like in Africa who have experienced imperialism for hundreds of years, from France, from Belgium, from, you know, the United uh, Kingdom. And it's just something that about being a collective and being amongst themselves and being self-sustaining could probably mean a lot to them and like may not make sense for us and our idea of individual liberty, but it would make sense for them, especially with the things they've experienced. Good, I'm glad. Just being aware of that. See yourself as other people see you. <laughs> Go ahead, Alexis. Going with her talk a bit about how other countries, how like what their what works for them works for them and we can't go and impose on what we think. I truly like I truly agree with that. There's a lot of countries where if they had America's laws, rules, and all that, it wouldn't work for them. If we take Japan, for instance, Japan is technologically super advanced than us, but their laws and their the way they live is completely different. You have to have a doctor, a doctor's like medical doctor degree before you're allowed to give tattoos to someone. You have to go through a year and six months worth of information and training and processing just to have a gun like and that works for them they only want the police to mainly have like right like have a gun and that's what works for them if we went in and we try to like hey you have to do this the american way they'd be like whoa what are you doing like we don't even know english like that like what are you doing fam and i think what she was saying was completely correct how we can't do that and it's it's like saying personalities. Everyone's personality is different and how they handle situations are different. We can't, I can't force someone to have the same personality as me. But is the ultimate political goal the same? 
to rule for the sake of the rules and promote a middle class. And then they just have very different ways of getting there. Could you say that? Yes, absolutely. Their middle class is one of, personally, I would say way better than our middle class. They're, in Japan, you mean, or China? Yes, in Japan. Yeah. Japan's middle class is way better than ours. I think that their common goal is to have a peaceful country and to support its people and to have a wonderful, flourishing life. And I think that's all that matters. Okay. Uh, I did, I read a study that was about the uh, the working class person in Japan compared to the working class person in America and their overall happiness uh, towards certain subjects. Their stress was a lot higher, it seemed, in Japan, but also there was a lot higher, like, degree of success feeling, like, like you did well. And, like, you're supporting your community was a lot higher there than it was here. And so I think it's that idea that you're doing something for the whole of your country uh, that really like makes the difference. Also, they're so much smaller than us. They can enforce laws that we can just not enforce because it would just, it's too large. You can drive, like in, in Europe, you can drive five hours and pass five different countries. Here, you can be five hours in the same state and still have halfway past another state. So it's, it's not the same comparison. Right. Somebody else. Um, Jordan actually kind of stole what I was going to say uh, with the size difference, um, especially being in like China compared to the U.S. too. China is a lot, is larger. We're both uh, very big countries uh, in the world, but I think China's still larger than us. What about our federalist system? In other words, each state can has a lot of independence in the laws they make. That wouldn't be true in China, right? Yeah, agreed. I mean, we can look at Hong Kong as a something like that, where everyone thinks that Hong Kong or Taiwan or Taipei is like in China, but they're kind of not. Like they don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the world is starting to recognize them as not being a part of China as well, especially like technically Hong Kong can and Taiwan can both qualify for the World Cup, which is I I know it ties it back in soccer, but that's like the biggest sporting event for the world is if like they're being recognized by that institution, what what else might happen? The question is whether China is going to continue to consider them uh, independent states. Yeah, think, it might be another um, Russia-Ukraine scenario. But let's hope not. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about what Colin was talking about. Like North Korea was, I think it was 2012 before they were allowed into the Olympics. And I remember like the civil outlook on what North Korea was or like people talk about it changed drastically as soon as they were allowed into the Olympics which I think it's kind of insane, but he's right. Like that's one of the world unifiers is sports. Like we all are into it and we want our like country to win. It's yeah, I've, I've written a paper about the ancient Olympics and how it really is trying to promote peace. It really was designed to promote world peace actually. Um, but I want someone to comment on our founding fathers liked Confucius. Come on, somebody go ahead, Alexis. I was like, I was going to say, do you want me just to state what I said to you earlier about mine? Sure. So I did my comment on the Confucianism and the Founding Fathers. And I wasn't surprised that the Founding Fathers loved Confucianism. They never really spoke out on religion. I don't really think a lot of them were Christians, but they were still high respected men in society. Um. They could have Christian mindsets, but they were more focused on the better of society than their religion and enforcing their religion into society and then the government. They did focus on a lot on virtue and virtuous and how they thought about it. I also liked how like each person, like Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Paine, Samuel Adams, like they all had their own different like what they think it was. 
So Samuel Adams had armies are for defense, but virtue is for our, our best security. And how Benjamin Franklin um, said created a unit. Bring mom a jacket. Sorry, my mom texted me, she needed something. And how Thomas Jefferson said he um, admired Prince Lay and how he was like the great learning and how it was all like wisdom and deeper into it. I found that very, like I found that like I felt I looked more into it and I found how Confucianism was something they based their their viewpoint on a better country was would be. Anybody surprised that they wanted to form virtue clubs as an alternative to going to church <laughs> or depending on the church to do all the moral education? No, because no. they really wanted separation between church and state. That was that was a big part of it. It was because I think secretly people weren't Christian. I think that was a big part of it because they weren't really considering other religions at the time. Around that time, people were so like, it was, that's not what I don't think it was about. I think it was more about the separation between like understanding what is morally obligated by the Declaration of Independence and the Articles of Confederation than it is about, you know, uh, we need to have a religion to live by, so. We need a civic religion or a civic virtue, right? Because if, if people think the only, all of their moral education took place at church, then they're gonna think people who don't go to church or don't go to their church are bad people. And they're only faking it if they, does that make sense? I think that's still true. Go ahead, Michael. I was I was going to say I feel like we definitely still see that uh, especially in the south um, like in small rural communities where churches are like a social group as well as just like you know a religious one um, that you are definitely like not necessarily as like a child but like as somebody who like went to church like I can definitely feel like tension and judgment from like people in the church toward those that they don't feel are like following all you know the right the right things or just not going in general you know changing up churches etc yeah you can so does it make sense to you the founders were trying desperately to get people's consciousness away from that i don't think it's worked <laughs> Um, okay. Who else has it gone? Ryan? Sorry, I have like a lot of kids around me. Um, so it's not a real story we're talking about, but this is kind of one of the things in the reading. So it was kind of what we discussed yesterday since you uh, reposted some of the same reading. Um, but what I found really interesting was his quote at, it was a progression. It was like at 16, this was this, at this age, I was this. And then it was like 70, I could follow my heart's desire without trans transgression. And so that made me feel like his purpose or like you should find, like as you go through life, you should eventually find your purpose. And then you should be able to um, like follow exactly what you feel. And that comes with age and time. And I think that's like really interesting because kind of relating back to what we talked about yesterday like as much as I get really annoyed about like why is old people running our government maybe like that's the reason why because I don't know I don't think it's justified though but I mean maybe that was one of the reasons why they were thinking about an age limit you have to be a certain age um, and it kind of made me think of what we were talking about yesterday okay um yeah and America is very innovative and America, you know, people are millionaires when they're 28 years old, like Mark Zuckerberg, right? And that that's cool. Like, that's what you aim for. But it turns out he doesn't know a lot about people or about power or governing or, you know, he's thrown off when people misuse his product. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not stepping in on any sort of what he ought to do. I'm just saying he really was naive about that. I know because I remember reading that. Um, 
Okay, Alyssa, what about you? What was your, what did you pick up out of the readings that you wanted to talk about? Um, I was kind of thinking along the lines uh, with what Jordan was saying earlier before I got like kicked out of the class um, and about how um, like there are a lot of issues with like, you know, uh, communism and Confucianism but like there are so many more positives and in the same vein there's a lot of um positives and negatives with like democracy and what the founding fathers created but i think like one of the key differences is the pro like the positives of confucianism and communism like far outweigh the positives of democracy i think um, because like, if you look at like democratic societies, like the best parts, well, not necessarily the best parts, but the most important parts of like healthcare and all those things, they're like much more closest to Confucianism and communism than pure capitalism or anything. Yeah, the trade-off, I mean, you get housing, food, clothing, shelter, education, you know, a job, all this stuff, as long as you don't have free speech, <laughs> right? As long as you sort of do what you're told, it, it, there's a real balance there. There's a problem there. Um, Tim, what do you think? Wait, are you asking, what do, you, what do I think on what she just said or what do you, what I what get? What did you bring to class? Well, when I was, oh, I'm not on the wrong thing. When I was uh, read, when I was watching, when they said, um, um, well, to sustain China's global rise, Mr. XI is modernizing China's military and investing heavily in one trillion international trade. I mean, that kind of caught me because I don't know. There's a lot of talks about their army and stuff like that. Jim, you're fading in and out. Can you hear me? Yeah, just lean right close to the computer. Don't back away. <laughs> okay. Um, I was saying that. Um, yeah. Wait, did you hear anything I said? Still pretty hard to understand you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Oh man, I'm pressing something. Okay, hold on. Okay, so I was saying the um, about when China um, one trillion dollars. No, we lost you again. Um all right, so, okay, Tim, can you, can, do you have any idea what's wrong? Okay, I'm gonna go through the, I'm gonna go through this stuff and ask you to have, make another remark. You don't have any idea what's wrong. Okay, go ahead, Michael. Oh, I was just gonna make my like initial um, thing from the readings was where it was talking about, um, uh, I don't remember specifically how it was written, but basically if something's broke, like they fix it, you know, like if they recognize that something is broke, they fix it. Um, and how like we've seen like throughout readings and like the, what came to my mind was like the MLK readings, um, obviously like they knew that there was an issue, um, but it was, it was like, it was a, like they told them to wait, they told them to wait, to wait, to wait, to wait, you know? And like the only thing that comes out of like, whenever things are broken, like the longer you wait, the more issues it causes. Um, and I think that that's seen on like a, like a broader sense, um, like, <laughs> like um, even at the college, for example, we have awful um, lighting and cameras at the college. And this past year, like 35 people's vehicles got broken into. Like, I mean, it's just, it's just like a universal thing. Like if something is broke and then you, you put off fixing or changing it, you just create more problems. 
yeah, okay. This is another thing um, that you need to consider. We have so much political polarization and we spend so much money on elections and that money could go into helping people out, right? And one person gets in and if they control the Senate and the House, they'll pass one whole bunch of laws. And then the next party gets in and they pass completely different laws or else the president writes executive orders which completely override the laws. So the point is that there's no coherent vision. So Mr. Xi has gotten himself uh, put in as kind of an emperor, right? He can, he can rule for, I don't know, a long time, maybe forever till he dies. But there's one mind and it's governing everything and everything is coordinated. And he remembers, you know, from decade to decade, and you can really get places if you're organized like that and you plan ahead and you execute and your people thrive and you develop loyalty. And I mean, do we have moral authority in the face of that? Uh, what do you think? Somebody want to? Can we compete against that for the loyalty of developing countries? Well, I think it's more so about like not necessarily putting our own um, like uh, like our own goals in those countries. Like I think it's it's about um, like, yeah, I understand that we are like helping them, but I think it's about like compromise, um, helping them in the best way possible for them and not necessarily the best way possible for us when we go into those countries? I, that's what I was about to comment about. Uh, if that, Michael, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so I, I took a summer course called the AGS uh, that we talked about social entrepreneurship, which is the concept that it's extremely bad to donate to these other countries because it completely tanks their economy. Like uh, I remember in Haiti, the number one, the Haiti earthquake happened, you know what the number one export or like donation to them was? Rice. You know what their number one product of selling and everything their farmers do? Rice. So the people who live there could not build off their economy because everything else was free. You can't compete with that. So it completely tanks their everything about them. And then like in Africa, the, you know, the Tom's initiative where they would like, if you buy a pair, they'll give a pair that also ruined the economy because there's so many people who actually have to make the shoes in Africa because they don't really export out from there. And there's so many things like going to the actual places and giving them jobs, putting factories there um, and like giving people an equal opportunity, like Ben and Jerry's, they pay their farmers like other countries rates because they understand that they get exploited a lot. And that's what would happen, I think, is they would get exploited. But with China's offering, I feel like is more of a stability that they didn't have before. I think that's what it, like they would really appreciate. And I don't think that America could provide the same thing because we don't function the same way. You got it. Or the oil companies come in and just bribe a local tribal leader whose tribe is on that land and just pulls it out, right? I mean, there's lots of ways that Things, I mean, it's worrisome when I had those students in Southeast Asia, China had come, has come to Southeast Asia because it wants this whole trade route from there to Africa and they, they buy the ports and they build roads and bridges and all sorts of infrastructure and the rulers cannot turn them down because it's a lot of money and it's a lot of infrastructure. And so um, that's, uh, I just think we ought to be aware of what's happening um, politically, but I do want, but you know, that's fine. That's today in politics. I want to go back where you could, you know, it's perfectly feasible that you would let, let Confucius Analect sort of be your words of wisdom 
for the day or what you read at night. Like some people read the Bible. You could read Confucius. It's perfect. I just want to give you that sense that it's just as good an ethic as anything Christian or, you know, it's a really good ethic. Um, yeah, go ahead, Michael. I was just going to talk like uh, one thing that like Ryan has said a lot is like uh, just the idea that we we take out of these readings, like what we want to take out of them. And so I feel like, you know, from any of the read, like any of the uh, other religions that we study in the future, because I know we start to study a couple different ones. Um, I think it really is about like your mindset and what you are trying to get out of these things, uh, as well as interpretation, um, as we've also discussed. But the Bible will lend itself, I think, to more corruption because it has so many different views of God. And you can sort of, you can really cherry pick. Um, and also you have this personal God. And so it, it a lot, I mean, I think we mentioned this earlier that people's idea of God and what God wants really sounds exactly like them and what they want, right? <laughs> How, I mean, it, you can really project yourself and really make yourself God without realizing that. Uh, whereas with Confucius, I don't think you can do that, right? He's just, it's an ethic. Um, and Americans are not going to worship Confucius. And we're not going to worship Chi as the latest sort of Confucian ruler. So the capacity for corruption that Mr. Chi can actually use Confucius to gain power over people, that's not gonna to happen to an American. So that's why I would, you know, what the heck say, you might wanna consider teaching your children Confucius Analects. <laughs> um, and also I had some students, one of, the, one of the questions they could write papers on was, do you wanna raise your kid to believe in original sin, like the kid is a sinner, they're born into the sin of Adam, they want to do bad because it's bad, and so you have to be authoritarian, or do you want to raise your kid to think people are by nature good, and so you're always sort of assuming that they really want what's good, and if they act out or something, you just kind of curb them, you know, but always really by nature you're good, but, it, you know, there's a lot of follow through. I mean, you've got to cultivate that child or somewhere in between. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, this is a question. So like in an instance like that, where you uh, raise your child like um, with the with the idea that they're good, do you also raise them with the idea that all, everyone, all other children are good as well? Oh, yeah. Okay. Human nature, people are by nature good, right? So it's right. all about your duty, remember? your duty to other people. So of course, the way you treat other people is gonna be every single relationship is guided by some duty. Um, anyway, so the students, a lot of them, you know, wrote interesting papers about that. Usually they had some kind of middle ground. Um, all right, so let me go to the outline about the reading. Well, I just wanted to comment real quick. Go you. ahead, Jordan. Fine. I read this. Um, I was watching The Good Place, and they talk a lot about philosophy in that show. And they recommend this book called uh, What We Owe One Another. Oh. So it's like a really, I really like it. It's about how human humans are like a collective spirit almost. And like what we owe one another, what we were talking about with like respect. We're talking about with basic human kindness, what it means to be humane to another person. Like, it's just really interesting, so. Yeah, I, you know, the odd thing about the Greeks is they have all these gods and goddesses doing all this horrible stuff. And I think what they're trying to get at is we have a capacity for doing all this and you have to recognize that so that it doesn't kick in. <laughs> but, and that's where, um, if you just focus on the always being nice, how do you deal with situations that involve some, you know, aggression like self-defense or situations where 
you're trying to fix a whole system that is uh, corrupt so that the situations you actually get in are structured by a bad system. And so then this has happened, right? Mary Wollstonecraft, she went and throw out everything. You know, she didn't, she was uppity. A lot of those feminists like broke all the rules, right? Because, or people wanting racial equality didn't conform and didn't always, you know, so that's where non nonviolent demonstrations are important is that you have to treat people decently, but you have to agree to disagree and you have to demonstrate for change. And if they accuse you of inciting violence, that isn't, you know, you have to make it clear that that is not the case. Um, does that make sense, Jordan? Yeah, I mean, it, it's good. It's very good as a base, like the Sermon on the Mount is very good as a foundation. Then you have to figure out what to do next. Um, but that the Analex also. Um, all right. So again, our founders had Europe in the back of their head. It's um, and they saw all the dysfunction that went on and saw the way religion was used and saw the economic inequality and um, wanted to create something, some alternatives. And so Confucius Analects really would be helpful because you'd have this whole ethic, this set of sayings. You wouldn't even have to, I'm, the founders, probably some of the ones in those virtue clubs, they didn't have to tell anybody where they got their little Analects. You know, they could just sort of put them together, their favorites and create this virtue club around those set of um, guidelines. And because it, I do think it would be intuitively obvious that this would be really helpful to counter our rugged individualism and to get people to get along so we can really create a society. So, um, all right, let's see. Um, a manual for public devotion. He, yeah, he, he created this. He omitted any biblical passages. So that, <laughs> that's kind of interesting. Um, and it is, it's so amazing because that's not what you get told about the founding fathers, right? You get told they were big Christians and big patriots and they weren't, they were really free thinkers. Uh, okay, here's the article about emotional intelligence. Um, this really, when I read this, I thought it was really funny because it's, how come these people get to make millions of dollars uh, selling these books? Because it's right there in Confucius or in Buddha and, um, all right, so what were their, criteria let me um let me go to a different document where the actual stuff is read is um, laid out and then you can then I want you to react to that let's see where it is here it is okay the good hey. readers go ahead they're willing to delay gratification so which virtue is that Which virtue is that? Like temperance? Yeah, right? Self-control in relation to uh, eating, drinking, sex, but just basically impulsivity, right? Uh, what about they can tolerate conflict? Which virtue or virtues would that be? Come on. Anger, right? Or courage, the courage to face a conflict and the ability not to get too angry or not angry enough. Does that so make sense? Ability? 
Okay, very good. Sociability. Anybody else? All right, they focus. Um, all right, so they stay focused. Which one would that be or which group of them? Don't you think basically uh, maintaining your composure is finding the mean between extremes that like all of them together is the kind of person who stays focused. Does that make sense? Does anybody have a particular one? They don't get distracted. They can differentiate between real problems and bank background noise. That is pretty much the maintaining your mind, right? The whole ethic is about practical wisdom, having a mind for knowing how to make good judgments about particular situations. What about judiciously courageous? Which one would this be? Courage. Right, and it's pretty much exactly what Aristotle said, right? Uh, not being afraid of loss of reputation or um, uh, social ostracism, but being able to speak, right? for the right reason in the right way. They're in control of their egos. Which one would this be? Rational ambition. Okay, could be. Could be self-knowledge, you know. Um, admit when you're wrong and willing to do things someone else's way. So that, again, that's just kind of a description of practical wisdom. They're never satisfied. What about that? I would also put that one under ambition. Yeah. Anybody have another alternative? These aren't cut and dried. It's just to give you a sense that there's so many lists of the virtues. There's so many different books you can read. And that's why I just like Aristotle's list because I think it's very comprehensive. Rational and then if you understand it, you can, you know, you don't have to try to follow this list and then that list and keep changing your mind. You can understand what well, these all are connected to the human condition. But does anybody have another suggestion? Okay. Recognize when things are broken and fix them. Truthfulness. <laughs> um, they're accountable. That's also truthfulness, right? And rational honor, they're not afraid of being dishonored if they've done something wrong. They're marketable, which I think is, and it means likable, which one is that? You should get that. Social ability, and I think it's rational kindness, or what is it called? Oh, rational generosity is um, literally giving money away, but also um, giving your time. But sociability would be the one that it would occur to me. They neutralize toxic people. What would that be? Um, even temperedness could. Okay. All right. Um, they consider the difficult, difficult person's standpoint, right? The ability to listen just like Socrates did and find common ground and solutions. Okay, bringing it all together. All right, so that's, does everybody understand how this is uh, very Aristotelian, but you can also compare it to Confucius, right? Confucius has a lot of those same virtues. 
And I always wonder why these people can make, they make millions of dollars <laughs> with the latest virtue book. Um, well, wasn't, weren't those like, uh, like things that you want out of like an employee? Did I read that correctly when I was yeah. reading? Yeah. Is, yes. I just thought that was like, I just thought that was interesting. Yeah. And then it's, uh, oh, what's the name of the book? Something 2.0. Um, but it's just, oh, emotional intelligence. All right. So that's important when you apply for a job that people will look for that as much as they'll look for your grades and your qualifications. Here's um, George, George Washington's thingy. Um, all right, so now let's talk about, I'll just call him Xi, okay? I know that, I think it's Xi Jinping, but I know that, um, I heard a lecture about him and he just called him she. So um, she has now created a political doctrine that Xi Jinping thought and it's everywhere. Okay, this sounds like the way Confucius operated, right? Confucianism, the whole tradition was everywhere, right? So that's something that in works in China. And, you know, I was in China in 2010. It would be so interesting to go back because I'm sure it would be different. Um, when I was in China, I knew that they had a doctrine called um, when they allowed capitalism into their, into their country. This is, this is truly interesting. They allowed capitalism in, but they called it socialism with a Chinese character <laughs> and you know because they have to say socialism all right or then or they're toast okay in our country we can have health care but it has to be called capitalism with an American character right <laughs> we're, we're not going to call it socialism um some some people did during the tea party but when it when Obamacare became popular enough, you'd have to call it capitalism with a, um, I mean, capitalism with an American character. It's uniquely American that we have capitalism, but we also have healthcare. Um, all right, so what's the, he, okay. He began what he calls a great rejuvenation to restore China to its ancient prominence and glory. What does that remind you of, guys? Come on, you've read it. What does that remind you of? Hitler, kind of. <laughs> well, that's true. And Russia, you know, Putin is the same way. But this is she speaking. How did Confucius, you know, what was the cornerstone of the way he operated? He was trying to like bring it back to the good old days. That's right. Remember the golden age. This is not who we really are. We really are from the golden age. And then he said, you know, I'm a student of the classics and I honor all that wisdom from the past. And he didn't take it literally, right? He wasn't an antiquarian. He was definitely manipulating this image, but he created this image of a good old days. And this is what the Chinese really are. And we're gonna, we have to reawaken this in our, this is our real Chinese character. And then, yeah, Hitler did it, Putin did it, uh, Trump did it, make America great again. Uh, it's very powerful, a powerful political tool, but especially in China, um, because there's plenty of people in the US that don't wanna go backwards, like women, African-Americans, non-binary uh, tech, 
tech people. I mean, but in China, I think it would get a much broader acceptance. It's it's way more woven into the culture. So does everybody understand how he knows? Obviously, he knows his history, and he's definitely tapping in to this powerful cultural force when you talk about we're going to rejuvenate it, get it back to the good old days. Um, does everybody understand that? Because they used to be the most advanced society for a long time. Um, and they got exploited, the opioid wars and all that stuff. I mean, he's got a lot to work on, to work with in terms of trashing the West, <laughs> the way we treated them. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. So China's become the world's second largest economy and a powerhouse of global trade and investment. Um, the Chinese people are realizing their dreams. They're getting lifted up. They're having a better um, standard of living. They, he's investing in um, this international trade initiative. He's expanding the scope of the military. Um, so this is you know, important for you to be aware of. Um, okay, and he's taken over. Um, okay, and he's arguing that you can't have a unified China unless the Communist Party governs, which again, that would be pretty compelling. It sure looks like it. Um, okay, because, and now that the West, uh, there's so much dysfunction in, in the US, then he goes, well, why? Why should we choose that when we have this very well oiled system that's providing people with what they need? Um, all right, in the propaganda, he's referred to as Ling Zhu, a reverent Chinese word that was also used for Mao Zedong. Okay, so Mao also figured out how to trigger a mindset, but the same mindset of this, you know, one man who is honored. Okay, so the communist revolution explicitly threw out Confucianism because that was related to the emperor. So they trashed Confucius, terrible, we're going to have this people's rebellion and we're going to have this whole communist ideology is totally different but psychologically he also had his little uh red book and he also was referred to in this very reverent way but it wouldn't be the same word that anybody used for confucius but it would be the same psychological orientation um Okay, so Mr. Xi doesn't mind going back to the older Chinese tradition. He doesn't mind referring to Confucianism. So that's very different from the way it was during the communist era. Um, all right. Okay, he's supposed to run the country as if it were his own family. And you know from reading the Analects that that was that was part of it. I mean, the ruler rules for the sake of the ruled and cares for them. Um, okay, this one is about, yeah, they, now they, he's at president indefinitely. This is another issue. I want to know how much you all know about this, that there's a rise of authoritarianism throughout the world um, in a lot of different countries. So when the wall came down, um, a lot of people thought that we would just be going more and more toward democracy. And so countries would get involved in international trade and they would interact with each other economically and politically, and we would set up diplomacy and we, everyone would have an interest in avoiding war because of what they really care about is trade and economic development. So that was the idea. Um, 
but it did not work out that way, right? So now we're having this shrinking, this going backward, and it's a lot of countries. Um, China, Russia, Egypt, Turkey, Hungary, Poland. Um, so I want you all to tell me if you're aware of this, because you happen to be going to college at a time when liberal democracies are being threatened and they're struggling in a way that has not been true before. So I do think you should know that because college students really need to know some of the basic stuff about what when they're on campus, what's going on in the world. Um, let's see, the trend toward authoritarianism is rooted, and then you can, I also want you, you to tell me if you have ideas about why this is happening, okay? This the claim here is it's people are insecure and afraid about the future. And globalization has not led to a rising middle class everywhere and to and to trade agreements that everybody can get engaged in and they favor everybody. What's happening is money sticking to money more and more. And the environment is falling apart. And developing countries are having more and more setbacks because of climate chaos. Um, and then rulers, authoritarian rulers, step up and say, OK, I'll fix it. I'll fix the economic system. I'll fix the globalization problems, um, the environmental problems. Um, and so his claim is the only stability uh, stability is the only way, and that requires this one person who really has the interests of the people in mind, and he will continually make a consistent, coherent plan for how China can rise and become the world superpower. That's what he's aiming for, of course. Um, so let me, I do want to clock in on that. Are you aware of the fact that you're stepping into history? When you go to college, it seems to me, now you're starting to create history. Now you have to take responsibility for the direction your life is going and the direction your country's going. And you have to be, this is it. You gotta be more aware. So uh, Colin, have you been reading or thinking about this rise in authoritarianism? Um, no, I actually haven't. Um, other. Do you think it's important? Yeah, probably. I just haven't had time to really look at news and just other things that aren't directly school related. Yeah, I know students have to work because school costs more and all that. Um, but on the other hand, you don't have a democracy unless the, the people are informed. And so the other thing is, I'm not saying you have to spend a whole lot of time. I'm just saying, if you can just get a general sense, maybe read a couple good books, then you can see the trends over time. That's, that's kind of the main thing. You can say, oh yeah, I remember when I was in college, that and now this. Go ahead, Jordan. Uh I mean, like a couple of years ago, France went through an election where they almost uh, elected an extremely authoritarian woman. Um, but it reminds me a lot of the, like the French wars, what happened after they wanted a lot of liberalism and then that became too chaotic and then they went straight into fascism. And it it's the bounce back because, I mean, this isn't something that's new. This happens over and over again. Uh, but I think it's new for us. We didn't. We thought we were past this. And frankly, what Tim was saying at like the one of the very first uh, classes, history repeats itself because we don't listen. You know. Very good. That's good. No. Yeah, that's to me that really is a major issue in liberal arts education because it's about 
free thinking, you get exposed to a whole lot of stuff. But the punchline is whatever else you learn, it will be to avoid falling back into irrational phobias and fears and looking to a strong man. Um, well, the Germany was also very advanced and had the Weimar Republic and everything. So just because we're high tech and just because, you know, we have all this culture, Germany had a lot of culture, you know, Beethoven and Bach, Vienna, that, I mean, geez, they had a lot, Kant and Hegel, they were very prominent in intellectual and cultural life. And they fell back. I mean, we need, to, there are lessons to learn. Um, Tim, are you aware of this falling back toward authoritarianism that's going on? I'm a little bit aware, but not really as much. Because I, 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 I hear stuff about it, but I don't really pay attention as much to it. But I, I can't say I don't know anything about it, though. Okay. Just sometimes hear like how they want people to be like that, but not not enough to recall it. Okay. There's a backlash against Black Lives Matter, you know. Um, anyway, Michael. Um. Yeah. I I I don't follow okay. a whole lot of anything outside. A lot of times, like my classes will bring me into. Um, like learning about things, um, but outside of that, I don't really. Um... Okay, well, I do have that reading group, and I, if you want, but also I ha I recently read a book called Democracies Divided, and it's about polarization, and so I think I've already scanned the introduction, and then there's a chapter in the U.S., so if anybody's interested in that, don't let me know during class, because I'm not trying to proselytize or anything. Uh, just if you if you're interested, send me an email, and then that'll be the way we do it. Um, so, I mean, on the one hand, I feel like I shouldn't uh, be in charge of recommending books, but on the other hand, there's so much that's biased, and it's really hard to find a book I think that can give you just an honest point of view. Um, so, you know, I offer what I have and somebody can think, well, that's also biased and I don't know you, but you can try it. And if you think so, then it's fine. I mean, it's respected, but you know, a lot of respected stuff is pretty biased these days. So, um, Alexis, are you aware of this? Oh my gosh, I would not unmute. I have been aware that what I do, I, I haven't really like thought of what I do will affect this country in the future. Like I haven't thought about it like that in that kind of sense. I have known that what I do is a role model for a lot of people. Like my nieces, my, my sister, a lot of people. It's something I have to do not only for myself but to prove to many people that it's possible and you don't have to struggle while you do it good well that's how it starts right it just um and how does that promote democracy well for kids not to go off the rails right to continue to move forward in their developing it's important um so it starts out with individuals and families and then it just keeps moving forward. So, um, Ryan? Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. So when you're saying, are we aware, like, are you talking about, like, are we aware that there's like author authoritarian rules? Is that what you're asking us? That is growing, that the number of authoritarian rulers in the world is growing and that our own democracy has been categorized as faltering yeah i mean well i actually didn't know that it was uh, i thought it was opposite opposite way around like i thought as we are um i guess we could say industrializing other countries that was 
typically like third world. I thought it was kind of moving in a direction, direction towards more democracy and less of uh, dictatorship. Uh, I think, our country? Our country? Uh, no, like countries in general. Oh, um, okay. Like, for example, like as time is going by, I feel like more people is realizing the the negative effects of dictatorship. And like, for example, like people in Russia, like I think the fact that Putin made the decision because he can, and he made the decision without kind of the the support of his most of his people, I think is showing like people the harmful effects of it. And so, um, yeah, I feel like I thought it was more more going towards the other direction. But other than that, like, yeah, yeah. I was aware. Like, yeah, I'm aware that there's uh, dictatorships around the world. Okay, it is important to know that when the wall came down, there was this growing trend. And now there have been some countries that have just literally fallen back, um, Hungary. Anyway, so um, huh, uh, Zane, what about you? And then I have one other question I want to ask students. Go um, ahead. Actually, it's kind of interesting that this topic brought up because I actually uh, live next to one of my teachers uh, from elementary and she's tra she travels a lot. Well, she, I forgot. I can't think of the country off the top of my head, but. She was actually talking about, I, we had this conversation not too long ago that she went to this country, I think it was probably when I was about third grade, so it was about 10 years ago, and she said just from, and she went this past summer, she's like, the two, like, the just within 10 years of how much, like, it's changed within, like, the like the authoritarian government and stuff like that, she just says it's crazy just within those, like, 10 years or so, and it, it's just, yeah, kind of like how it's been on the rise and stuff like that, so yeah, I have been kind of aware of it. Good. Um, all right. So let me look. I'm going to do one more round and ask you what you think. This article was a different model of how to govern. It has three divisions in their, in their government, just like we do. But they're the humane authority, the legitimacy of heaven, uh, and the legitimacy of earth, and the legitimacy of the human. And they have this sort of tricameral, tricameral legislator, legislature, a house of exemplary persons, um, should be a great scholar and all these great scholars. And then the second one is the house of, um, let's see, um, the house of the nation is a direct descendant of Confucius. So that brings in the history and then the House of the People is elected or by popular vote or the heads of occupational groups. And then he talks about how they deliberate and they have a checks and balances. So <coughs> that's just to make you aware, right? That <coughs> not every country is gonna have a le legislative, judicial and executive branch. And they're, you know, they're not gonna have the kind of division of powers that we have. And so just uh, think it through. Uh, and this one is important. I want each of you to pick at least one of these things that really strikes you. Because this guy knows America's weakness. And we have this ideology of freedom and equality. Freedom and equality, well, what about the facts, <laughs> right? Like we have this belief abortion should be illegal because it's killing. Well, as a matter of fact, when you make it illegal, you have more abortions. Doesn't anybody notice this <laughs> besides all this other stuff? So the Chinese would just look very pragmatically. What is the effect? How do you minimize abortions? Or how do you actually, they have forced abortions so that you can have a thriving population. So they don't have an ideology about abortion. They use it as a tool to promote a middle class. And that's what they do for everything. They don't have guns good, guns bad. They just have, how can you make, how can you have a population that's thriving? And I think, you know, nobody's allowed to have guns. Well, that, that makes sense in a very, very highly populated society where people are just, you know, the density 
of the population in those big cities. Um, <clears throat> anyway, everything is based on facts with the goal of human flourishing, right? The primacy of people's livelihood, getting rid of poverty is, the, is a right. So the government then can exercise a lot of authority if they can prove that this is what you need to do to lift people up out of poverty, 400 million people. That's, you know, that's a very compelling <laughs> set of facts. Uh, the importance of holistic thinking, because as I said, our system is so broken and each party keeps undermining the previous one. But if you have this one person with this big picture and he has priorities and he has sequences, the country will really improve. Government is necessary, right? We don't have a, this minimal government ideology. For him, it's an ideology, like it doesn't have anything to do with human flourishing. It's like you don't even, that's not your priority and you have all this stuff you're doing that's making people miserable. Even in a wealthy country, you're crazy. Um, good governance matters more than democracy. All right. You know, if people, Mr. Xi taking over and governing is better than having elections, because then you have all this internal strife and you have all these um, people undermining each other and people caring more about their party or themselves winning than about helping people. Good governance is, is what matters. Um, and performance legitimacy, like people get jobs based on proven ability to do the job, not on how much money you have or who your daddy is or anything like that. It's merit, it's what you, you earn your position. Um, Selective learning and adaptation. You keep learning from each other. You keep reading stuff to learn because it's a secular culture. You don't defer to some God somewhere. You just figure it out using your mind. Um, harmony and diversity. Uh, okay, so the great harmony is the big, that's what Confucius talked about. And he says, we have revived this old Confucian ideal harmony, the great harmony. Uh, we still have challenges and we're fighting corruption and all this stuff, but we think we have a better way of creating a thriving middle class. And that's what we want. Okay, you guys pick one each, everybody pick one or you can give your overall impression. Go ahead, Michael. Um, I like the one about holistic thinking, um, just because like the idea of like uh, synergy, like the sum of the parts, um, are, or yeah. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so that, that yeah, that's why I, I enjoyed that one. Just the idea that, you know, working together um, with a common goal in mind can definitely uh, increase production on all fronts for whatever you're trying to do. Yeah, prioritizing and sequencing, that's... Boy, we don't have any of that. Go ahead, Colin. Um, I like this uh, selective learning and adaptation one. Okay. Um, I, I, I just think it's cool, especially like the learning aspect of it, because it shows how they're like, I guess, adapting to the new life that's going to be into the future. I just think it would be benefiting, very benefiting. And it's kind of showing with their technology. Just one ironic thing is that you can have psychologists telling you, this is how children need to grow up for them to be stable. But as a matter of fact, you know, even when we know all that, we don't do it. Yeah. Children are in these incredibly toxic environments, we know they're going to grow up messed up. We know we're going to end up with, it's going to cost us a ton of money over an 80 year lifestyle plan, but we do nothing because everybody's free to do whatever they want. Okay, Colin, what do you think? Um, yeah, that will happen to some, like it will drive people 
mentally unstable. But if there's a few of them that can continue with that lifestyle and do well in that lifestyle, I say, why not? I think there should be like an option for like regular schooling than like focus schooling. Cause that's kind of like I explained to you one day after the meetings, that's kind of how it is back in like certain parts of Orlando. It's like, we focus on certain fields and that's why you want to go to that school. And right. It's just, that's in a vacuum. So maybe 25% of kids grow up in poverty and desperate or with parents that are never home because, you know, all this toxic stuff. And then 25% grow up with way more than they need. And they really think they need all this stuff. And they're leeching, you know, money away from the poor who need it. And there's, yeah, it's just a crapshoot, right? There's no overall plan. That's what I'm getting at. So yeah, you can have these magnet schools, but it takes a lot more than that for a kid to actually have a life and get educated and not have to worry about going home or having to work all, you know, all that other stuff. Um, anyway, okay, Jordan, what one did you pick? I actually picked the same one as Colin. Uh, I just thought that, you know, it's, I think some things are important for everyone. Like, I think some things should be, I don't think you should, your ability to live should dictate, be dictated by how much money you have. Like, I, I think that it's better for the whole of the people to benefit from something and everyone takes a little away from themselves than have everyone suffer because everyone wants to be an individual. Or, I mean, in that sense that everyone wants to be like, oh, it's only about me and my family and that's it, you know? And statistically, right? I mean, we have this high levels of putting people in prison, incarceration, and it costs so much money. And then we don't have any rehabilitation program. So we have this high rate of re re-entry you know it's just all of this stuff the statistics say this is absolutely crazy it's because we have for-profit prisons like i mean it's manual labor that is extremely cheap that they can use whenever they want and they make it so that like what you're saying they don't have reform programs because it's easier to get habitual offenders right and and you also have these toxic environments where it's just you're not doing anything to prevent people from going to jail or prison. And you have, yeah, anyway, it goes on and on, but this is where the Chinese can say, sorry, I mean, we have our, num our percentage of people that go to jail and prison is way lower, our number is gun violence, blah, blah, blah. Okay, Tim. I actually picked the same as Michael. He was okay. Having, he was talking about, um. Um, like working as a group and stuff like that. He kind of stole exactly what I was going to say. So, I mean, okay, good. Those were two good ones, the ones you chose. What about yeah. Alexis? So, I chose the group one, the same that Michael and Tim chose, just because I know how a lot of group work and a lot of group, like, a lot of projects need to be done as a group to get it done faster and more efficient. So, a lot. So a lot of society I think of as the same, like stuff needs to be done as a group as a whole to get it done better and efficient, more efficient. And people are taught to work together, right? Not to compete against each other. Um, and the reward system is for cooperation, not competition. Um, Ryan, what about you? Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. Um, I was just going to say it was kind of interesting, uh, the one where it says if we have a good government, we don't really need a democracy. Um, I think that was like interesting just because like as time has proven over and over and over again, humans have the power to be corrupt. And I feel like even if we have a good government, like it could have the potential to become corrupt. and history shows that and I feel like there's nothing that kind of outweighs freedom 
like in my opinion i mean in terms of like government versus freedom like i feel like like just because the government thinks it's good it doesn't mean it's good for everyone or that means it's a common good like our government probably thinks that they're doing good but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily good and so that's kind of subjective so i feel like that was kind of interesting yeah okay and he doesn't mention the possibility of corruption right and yeah, of course, he's not going to mention that. Um, and then the question is, though, what do people in the US have to choose to do with their freedom in order to keep the middle class going, right? Because if you if freedom means do whatever you like, we will get in trouble. So in order to prevent authoritarian, and how do we have to use our freedom to create an, enough stability and uh, enough people who are provided for and not afraid that we can avoid a strong man who comes and says, I'll fix it. Okay, Zane, what have you got? Uh, actually, I went with the, the selective learning as well. And like the part that actually stuck out to me was where it says like them learning from each other is prized and like cherished. And I thought that was really interesting. And it shows like how that like help them re revolutionize when it comes to technology and stuff like that. And I think like, I mean, not even just like the technology field, but just that in general, just, you know, making it a priority and cherishing, you know, learning from each other. I found that pretty interesting. Well, another really ironic thing is that we have a lot of graduate school programs. Okay, Alexis. Um, we have a lot of graduate programs in public policy. And when I was in Indonesia, the students were applying for these graduate programs. We really are graduating all sorts of people who are specialists in public policy. And I was, that would have been a possible career for me because I care about this stuff and to do it professionally. But the trouble is like you might be in housing and human services, like you've dedicated your lives to figuring out public policy so that African Americans could get decent housing, right? That's going to be my career. But you work for the, you know, Department of Labor, or De Department of Housing and Human Services, and you know, you get one president in there, and he gives you free reign to actually make these recommendations and initiates, implements, and then you have another president and completely destroys it, <laughs> and then you have, you know. So you, there's no continuity. And of course, that would be really frustrating. Um, but that's what we've got. And so I do think you can't just say, I prefer freedom and you know it's a crapshoot. I do think we have to constantly be thinking about how can we use our freedom so that we have a middle class and we don't, del we don't back backslide into authoritarianism. And it is a problem at this moment. A lot of uh, scholars who've studied other countries and the patterns in how they fall back, they never thought it could happen to us. And I read this book and they said that in the first paragraph, I thought, I knew it could happen to us. Where are you guys? You got to get out of your Harvard, Harvard office and actually talk to people. They're out of touch with people and that's not good, you know? Um, anyway, so here's the weekend. I will, you know, a lot of people are way behind. I hope you start getting stuff in. I think I have time to read it. I don't, you can email me if you want me to read it immediately. I mean, sometimes I go online and there's just no new posts. So I wait, you know, I wait a day or so. I might wait till Sunday unless somebody, you know, gives me the red flag and wants me to read it. That's fine. I don't have that many students. I'm I'm fine with whatever you need that I could. Um, all right, Tim. What whatever you need that I could um, help you. You know, it would be you would learn more if you get quick feedback and stuff like that. If you want a conference about your paper, usually the papers turn out better if students have conferences, but I'm not going to force it because it's too crazy. All right. 
Do you have any questions? We start on Hinduism on Monday. All right, take care. Have a nice weekend. You have to ruin it with your classwork, but that's life. <laughs>